Thank you for coming, shining the light of spirit here at Unity Spiritual Center of Manhattan. And as most of you have figured out, the title of my message is, I'm out of my head and you can be too. Now I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, well obviously we know Tim is out of his head, but why would we, the audience members, want to be out of our heads like Tim? That's a, a question that's been asked before. But with a little luck, you will understand the answer before we're done here today. This talk is going to deal with a number of Zen concepts. So I'm going to start with a Zen parable. So there was a university professor who traveled to see a revered Zen master. And he began asking the Zen master questions. It was obvious he'd been thinking about these deep spiritual questions for a long time. He had various speculations. And while the professor was talking, the Zen master made some tea and poured some tea into a cup for the professor. And when the cup was full, the Zen master kept pouring and the tea spilled onto the table. The master kept pouring and the tea spilled onto the floor. And the professor said, Master, can you not see that the cup is full? No more tea will fit in there. And the master said, like this cup, you also are full of your ideas and speculations. How can I teach you Zen if your cup is already full? Come back to me when your cup is empty. So let's say that we wanted to get into a more Zen frame of mind and we wanted to empty ourselves so we can receive new wisdom. What exactly does it mean to empty ourselves to receive the new? Well, does it mean to forget everything we know? No. Uh, we might need some of that knowledge in the future. We might need to remember how to do our tax forms so we don't go to jail, right? Does it mean to give up our ambitions and our plans? No, that could have bad consequences as well. Does it mean to give up our opinions? Well, yes, it can mean that in some cases. There's a Zen proverb that says, knowledge is learning something every day. Wisdom is letting something go every day. That's a little different than what we're usually taught in our society. Wisdom is letting something go every day. So a few months ago, Cindy Novella was here, and she asked a very important question. She said, how certain are you that your perceptions are accurate? She's talking about your perceptions of other people, your perceptions of situations. How certain are you that your perceptions are accurate? Can we see all aspects of a given situation? Of course not. Can we see the majority of the aspects of a situation? Not even close. Try less than 1%. And yet, whenever we judge people, or predict, or diagnose, we're relying on the idea that our perceptions are accurate. So do we have enough information to know that we're perceiving accurately? The thing is, if we really stop and think about it, we know that we don't have enough information to accurately judge the people and situations we encounter. But the instinct to act as if we do have enough information is so strong, often it seems like we can't resist it, right? And it's a lot like a cat playing with a string. The cat knows the string isn't really alive. The cat knows if the it really finally caught the string once and for all, it would be pointless. There'd just be a dead string lying on the floor, not moving. That's not what a cat wants. But the cat's instinct to chase a moving string is often so strong, it just can't resist it. And like that, our instincts to judge people and situations according to our limited point of view often seems too strong to resist. But of course we can resist if we train ourselves consistently over time to think differently. 
we might uh, if we can question our assumptions we can remind ourselves that from a different perspective the situation would look completely different now this doesn't mean that we have to entirely give up every opinion although there might be some opinions we want to give up but for the opinions that we're not ready to let go of how do we treat them if we're going to try to empty ourselves well we can remind ourselves that we don't know what's going on with another person so when we're you know judging someone perceiving someone we can remember that there are millions of factors that make up who a person is why they behave the way they do what their opinions are and we don't know what it's like to be that person on a day-by-day -day basis and there's another Zen story that I would like to read to you from this book this is One Bird, One Stone, a compilation by Sean Murphy. This is a compilation of contemporary Zen stories. And Sean Murphy noticed that people have kept using the same old Zen parables and stories that have been used for centuries, even though there's a lot of wonderful stories from more recent Zen masters. So he made this compilation to try to remedy that situation. And I'm going to be reading Dharma words from Yasutani Roshi. Dharma words mean spiritual teaching or instruction, and Yasutani Roshi was a Japanese Zen master. An electric news screen has a lot of light bulbs and shows letters by lighting some of them up. When you look at it from afar, it certainly seems as though the letters are flowing. But when you go up close and look at it, it's just some light bulbs going on and off and there's not a single flowing letter. In the same way as that, everything in the universe seeming to exist and seeming to be active is completely untrue. Everything in the universe is like that. Kind of hard to know how to take those words, right? Is, is nothing real? I mean, is this podium completely unreal? Is it just a figment of our collective imagination? I can't say with certainty exactly what Yasutani Roshi meant, but my interpretation of his words are, this podium does have reality. I mean, if I think it doesn't have reality, I'm probably going to change my mind as soon as I bang my shin on the corner, right? But when we look at the podium, what we see isn't the actual podium, it's not the reality of the podium. We see the mental construct that we have created which represents the podium in our mind. When I look at the podium, I see a device for holding notes and references while a speaker addresses an audience, much as I'm doing right now. What if someone was here who had never seen or heard of a podium before? They wouldn't, they wouldn't think that. They might think, wow, what a clever invention for protecting me from birds who are trying to dive bomb me, right? You just crouch down there, it's genius. But uh, the fact is that if there was an ant who had human intelligence, just for, just for the sake of the story, and an ant was crawling up the side of the podium, the ant also, I think, would have a very different interpretation of what this podium is. Uh, okay, we'll use one more example. What if we all found out that the Great Pyramid at Giza, the largest pyramid in the world, was actually built by an enormous giant to wipe his muddy boots on? Do you think that might change the way you look at the Great Pyramid forevermore? I think it might. Has the pyramid changed at all? No, it's exactly the same, but our mental construct has changed in this scenario. There's a book called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, where it likens Zen Mind, the mind of a Zen master, to beginner's mind. When we are very first beginning to learn a new skill, such as uh, maybe painting pictures, for example, our mind is open to boundless possibilities because we don't know what we're going to learn while we practice this new skill, but after we've studied that and we've 
become very good at that. Our mind is crowded with many mental constructs about how you should paint, how you shouldn't paint, and everything in between. So we've lost that beginner's mind, that Zen mind. Wittgenstein, the famous philosopher, said, that of which we do not know, we must not speak. That of which we do not know, we must not speak. But if you really think about it, our entire society is largely based on the idea of speaking about that which we do not know. There's an old Calvin and Hobbes comic strip where Calvin is taking a test and the question is, what was the significance of the Erie Canal? And Calvin writes, in the cosmic sense, probably nil. And then he smiles and says, we big picture people rarely become historians. <laughs> but maybe Calvin is wiser than he knows. We're trained to have all these ready answers to every question based on assumptions, generalizations, predictions, and theories. But despite all of our predictions and theories, can we know the future? No. We can't know the future. In most cases, we can't know with certainty what exactly happened in the past either. So even less can we be certain of answers to open-ended questions like what was the significance of the Erie Canal? Okay, if that ant happened upon the Erie Canal, do you think it might have a different interpretation of the canal's significance? I think it might. Now, perhaps you're thinking, oh gosh, this Tim guy. If we go through life with no ideas about what's going on, we're just like blind rats in a maze. We're just bumping into things with no concept of where we're going. Actually, you probably weren't thinking that, but I bet you are now. <laughs> yes, you're thinking, yeah, we got to have some idea where we're going. This time, this Tim guy is talking baloney. Why are we even listening to him? A question that has been asked so many times before. So, okay, I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to make informed decisions in our life. That's why we were given a mind in order to help us make decisions. But maybe we shouldn't get so worked up about everything that we see in our lives or in the news the news was specifically and carefully designed to upset us pretty much as much as possible. Think about it. There's over seven billion people on this planet. If one in a million people, one in a million, is having something horribly catastrophic happen to them right now, that's still over 7,000 people in each and every moment that's having something catastrophic in their life now, why would the news want to focus on the one in a million people whose lives are the most catastrophic right now? Maybe it's because we keep tuning in to watch it. But do you think there's just as many positive things as there are negative things? Yes, of course there are. Are we going to see equal representation of positive things in the news? Not anytime soon. So maybe we shouldn't let our view of what the world is experiencing, what the world is like, be so warped by the news that we see or that we read. Just, just an idea, just throwing it out there. So, there is a, an old Taoist parable. So you thought it was all going to be Zen parables, but switching it up a little bit here. So the, the Taoist parable talks about a horse rancher and the horse rancher's servant comes to him and says, Sir, horrible news. There was a break in your fence and your prize stallion has escaped. He's, there's no sign of him. He's completely gone. And the horse rancher says, Who knows if it is good or bad? And the next day, the servant comes to the horse rancher and he says, Wonderful news, sir. Your prize stallion has returned and he has brought five new mares with him. Isn't that wonderful? And the horse rancher says, 
Who knows if it is good or bad? And the next day, the servant goes to the rancher and says, Horrible news, sir. Your son was trying to break in one of the new mares, and he was thrown from the horse and broke both his legs. He won't be able to walk for months. And the rancher said, Who knows if it is good or bad? And a few days later, the emperor's army came through the area, conscripting all of the young men to fight in a horrible and bloody war. But they passed over the rancher's son because of his two broken legs. Anyone, anyone want to guess what the rancher said? Who knows if it is good or bad? Yeah, you guys are good. You got it. Pretty awesome. So when we're committed to a single interpretation of everything, such as a single interpretation of whether it's good or bad, we can't actually experience the thing itself. Whenever we're presented with that subject or that thing, we just react how we've been conditioned to react, which means we're not interacting with the actual thing, but we're interacting with the construct of that thing, which is in our head which represents that thing. So, in other words, we end up living in our heads. Living in our heads is something that Zen masters don't really recommend. They recommend more if we can get back to beginner's mind. That's a little bit better. So that we can experience things in a way that is new and different. Now, perhaps you're saying, I like my life just the way it is. Why would I want anything new and different? And uh, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> and the answer is, well, we human beings, most of us experience something called suffering sometimes. And most of our suffering is caused not by what happens to us, but by our interpretation and perception of what happens to us. It's caused by our mental constructs relating to what occurs. So, what if we can break free of those old ways of thinking and perceiving, experience a way of life that has less suffering, more joy and happiness and peace. And it's always wonderful if we can break free of old repetitive thought patterns. So, there's a video online which all of you can look up if you want. It's about a young man who is experiencing an enormous amount of suffering, dealing with his mental constructs which were unhelpful to him. At first, growing up, he thought he was going to have a great life. Until age 17, it all came crashing down. He developed psychosis. He developed severe paranoia. He thought everyone around him was trying to get him. He thought they were trying to kill him, and he believed that was the truth. And from his severe paranoia, he went into mania. And from mania, there came hallucinations, both auditory and visual. And between the psychosis and the bipolar disorder and the hallucinations, he was spinning completely out of control. And he believed, this is what his thought constructs told him was the only interpretation. He believed that he was nothing but a burden to everyone around him. So he decided to take his own life. He wrote a suicide note and he jumped off of the Golden Gate Bridge. And there's something you should know about the Golden Gate Bridge. Since its completion in 1937, over 2,000 people have jumped to their deaths from the Golden Gate Bridge. Only 1% of people who jump from the Golden Gate Bridge survive. So it's, it's very lucky for us. For our story, Kevin, our hero, was in the lucky 1% who survived. And he reports the same thing that 19 survivors of jumping from the Golden Gate Bridge reported. When he catapulted over the railing, the millisecond that his hands left the railing he experienced instant regret. And he remembers thinking, nobody's going to know that I didn't really want to kill myself. And after he survived the jump, of course there was a big ordeal, but then he began the long road to recovery. There was 
seven psych ward stays over the next 11 years. But today, Kevin lives a good and rewarding life because during his road to recovery, he gradually changed his thought constructs that related to his mental illnesses and his behavior, how, his, how he coped. And part of that was he was able to open up to people who cared about him instead of keeping it inside. So now he has a wonderful support system that's extremely powerful. And all in all, he was able to stop living in his head so much. And like Kevin, all of us can learn to question our thought constructs, to hold them more lightly, more freely, so that we too can say, I'm out of my head and you can be too. Thank you.